Okay, great. All right, Levinas, introduction to Levinas. How much time do I have? Almost an hour, great. <laughs> All right, so now Levinas, to be honest, in my view, is the hardest philosopher out there. Nobody, <laughs> nobody, comp in fact, if you, can, if you can get through Levinas, you can get through pretty much anything. Even Hegel, piece of cake <laughs> next to Levinas, right? So it's just more boring. That's what's the problem with Hegel. Uh, Levinas at least is interesting, right? So it's a very difficult philosopher. And I've given you a text which is not one of his easiest texts, right? But of course, I'll give you the background the conceptual background you need to be able to navigate those texts. But don't be surprised, right, if your first encounter with Levinas is a complete disaster. It's okay, right? It's fine. Me too. When I first encountered Levinas, I didn't understand a word. Um, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll study it together. In any case, what all that you need for your own essays is to understand the lectures, right? So, all right, so let's get into, uh, let me introduce him a little bit. There's three things I'll talk about. Number one, I'll talk about post-Holocaust philosophy, because this is where we are now. Um, Buber was pre-Holocaust, Levinas is post-Holocaust. Number two, I'll talk about his biography and experience in the army, which is important. And number three, we'll talk about uh, his philosophy, uh, phenomenology and ethics. These are the two main pillars of his philosophy. Okay, so of course, <laughs> I'll give you a brief introduction to phenomenology, which is supposed to be a whole course <laughs> taught in this, uh, in our department. And it's my fault since it hasn't been taught. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm actually thinking of teaching a whole class on Levinas, and then we would go into the phenomenology in the future. <laughs> so. All right, so uh, good, the epoch. All right, so we are at the time right after the Holocaust, right? Levinas is born uh, shortly, he's born in 1906, and, and he will go, he will live through that experience, right? So his whole thinking is going to be informed by that event, right? This is typical of um, philosophers in France at the time. You also have Sartre, who is like this, right? They are, philosophy is shifting, right, from being just, you know, abstract thinking to thinking which is embedded in an event, right? This is kind of where existentialism starts, right? Levinas is in a way part of this movement. We think about life. We think from what happened, from the encounter with life, we think. It's not we think and then we modulate life, right? Kind of like um, Kant, right? Remember Kant? Kant, you have your, you know what to do, the right thing to do in your head, and then you kind of Enter reality. Uh, this is the opposite, right? Existentialist thinking, which Levinas is a part of, reality informs your thinking. You, you philosophize from something you have experienced. So this is a very new, uh, this is a shift, right? Um, uh, between modernity and existentialism. Um, okay, existentialism to philosophize from existence. That would be the best definition, right? So, um, so, right, so Levinas is also, in addition to his thinking being informed by what he experienced during the Holocaust, he's also going to try to analyze what happened, diagnose what happened, help us not go back to what happened, right? This is really Levinas's obsession. He's not the only one, but his, his goal is really to, to um, in a way, like a doctor, right? Diagnose the problem and give some kind of remedy to whatever happened that made us accept, as Europeans, what happened? Because remember, this was not just a German problem, right? Uh, when the Nazis took over, first of all, they conquered most of Europe, but that wasn't it enough, right? Because what happened was when, when the Jews started to get deported, they had the complicity. It wasn't just the Germans deporting. It was the Germans uh, and the populations of the different countries they had invaded. So for example, France, of course, the Germans were in charge for a while. We try to forget this, but <laughs> it's true. And of course, the French, many French people cooperated, right, with the Germans, or they turned a blind eye. These were the two, there were three reactions in France. Cooperation, turning a blind eye, and actually helping the Jews escape. Just a small minority, right? So the countries were complicit. It wasn't just the Germans who were barbarians. Everyone, in a way, in Europe 
ended up being complicit in some way or other, right? Uh, and so what, what Levinas is doing along with a lot of other post-Holocaust thinkers is trying to think, well, how did we as Europeans get to the point where we would be complicit with this, right? Remember, Europe had a very high opinion of itself <laughs> for a long time. Europe was supposed to be the beacon of light to the nations, right? The term enlightenment, right, which came from Europe, Enlightenment, right, which is uh, which was birthed in France, right, was the idea that France, right, was a, a beacon of light, of rationality, of common sense, and of course it had to share this kind of you know beautiful uh, worldview with everyone who was primitive and <laughs> and inferior, right? Europe in general saw itself as an example to the nations, as a light unto the nations, and so Europeans were really, uh, in a way, traumatized to realize well, how. How could we, so civilized as we thought we were, become complicit in this, right? So this was really a wake-up call. Okay, so there's, um, right after the Holocaust, just to give you an idea of the thinking that was taking place, there was a, a group of people who got together, and it was called the Circle of Frankfurt. So this is in Germany. These were a group of philosophers. Uh, some of them were Jewish, some of them were not, right? They got together right after the war in order to think through what happened. Why did Germans, so they were all Germans, right? How could we, right, allow this sort of barbaric, barbaric behavior to take over, right? What happened? And um, two of them very famously wrote, so Adorno and Horkheimer, uh, very famously wrote a book called, hmm, I have the name in French, but not in English. Um, I'm gonna look it up. One of you can look it up. Um, look up what, you, what these two, somebody look up <laughs> what these two guys wrote. It has to do with the enlightenment. It has the word enlightenment in the title. So whoever finds this, I would be greatly indebted. Thank you, Perio. <laughs> Dialectic of enlightenment, you guys are great. All right, Dialectic of enlightenment. It's a very good read. Um, I think personally, and in this work, so I'm going to give you the, the outline of this work, they actually ponder whether the Holocaust was just an accident of history or whether there was some kind of preparation to it, right? So they come to the conclusion that actually the Holocaust had been in the works for centuries before. And so what does that mean? What do, you, what do we mean that the Holocaust had been in the works, right? And they situate the problem in philosophy, in the way that the West conceives the subject, conceives the other, right? In the Western philosophical mindset, that is where they see the seeds of the Holocaust. So this is quite powerful, right? Because we always think as Westerners that our philosophy is the most evolved, the most clairvoyant. <laughs> Actually, they saw that there was a deep, deep flaw in Western philosophy which uh, gave rise to the Holocaust. And this flaw, of course, they, I mentioned this at the beginning of class, they, they blame Descartes or desecrate for one of you. <laughs> so they blame Descartes. Um, and I mentioned this already. Remember when I talked about uh, the argument by analogy? Let's see how many of you remember this. Um, turning on the gallery. Every, anybody remember when I talked about the argument by analogy? You can put your hand in the screen if you remember. Do you have a couple of you? Okay, great. So um, Descartes, remember, everything starts with the self. I'm just summarizing very quickly. Uh, the self is the foundation and everything else is derived from the self, including the other, right? So the self in a way is the origin of meaning. This is typical of Western thought. The self is always the origin of meaning, whether it's Descartes or Kant. Kant, of course, in the critique of pure reason is doing that. He's saying the self is the beginning and then path. We categorize everything from our head. Uh, and of course, Husserl, uh, is, which is Levinas's mentor, right? So we have Descartes, Kant, Husserl. These are the main culprits, right? Uh, who, who, who develop this notion of the self being the origin of meaning. And so the other becomes a production of the self a satellite of the self. The other doesn't have much weight, right? What matters is the self. I mean, we have this still, even in our country, right? In the ethos of our country, the self is the primary uh, entity that we need to protect. My self, 
right? My need for self-expression, my need for, you know, freedom, my need for property. We're not talking ever about protecting the rights of the others, <laughs> right? It's the individual that we protect. So this is coming from there, right? We are very, very much indebted to the West in the way that we think here in the States, right? So, so, so the bottom line, right? The self is the producer of meaning, is the origin of everything, is the center of everything. And so the other is not really a concept which was developed in the Western mindset, right? The other is not really, doesn't really have any texture. There is no weight given to the concept of the other. And, and so, this, so this way of thinking, Horkheimer and Adorno are saying, this is what led to our political attitude, right? If we have the attitude that the self is all that matters and everything else is, the other is kind of dismissed, <laughs> at the periphery, um, politically speaking also, the self is at the center and the other is kind of, doesn't even, we don't have a concept of it. And so it's very easy, right? When the other starts to become endangered that we simply miss the event. <laughs> we kind of don't really have a sense of because the other has no weight in our worldview, in the Western worldview, right? We don't have a whole ethics of the other. We have an ethics of the self, right? This started with the Greeks all the way to the 20th century, right? So, so they, they believe, right, that this, it is precisely this mindset that puts the self at the center and the other at the periphery and that the fact that we don't have a concept of the other that has been developed, this is what allowed for people to miss the event of the other's extermination, right? Um, and so that's why they say, right, it is in our mindset that the seeds of Holocaust already existed, right? Um, so this is giving you a little bit an idea of what was going on right after the war, what people were talking about. And of course, Levinas is part of this movement. He's going to have a powerful critique of Western thought, which he thinks suffers from, I'll quote him, it suffers from an allergy to the other. He actually says it like that, right? Western thought is so entirely focused on the self, on the subject, that it has no sense, no concept of the other, not a real solid concept. Um, take, for example, uh, and, and the other exists, by the way, has dignity only because it resembles the self. Remember, we talked about this. Uh, so this is the argument from analogy. So this has been developed actually greatly by Husserl in his... Um, in the Cartesian meditations that he wrote, right? This is a meditation on the philosophy of Descartes. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested in Husserl, this is the place to start, <laughs> the Cartesian meditations, right? Don't go anywhere else, <laughs> this is the best. Um, so in that uh, meditation, he gets to, he follows Descartes, right? The self is the beginning, constituting the world. And then it comes to the problem of the other. And this is where he makes the argument that I see the other, I see that the other behaves like me, and therefore the other must have a subjectivity and internality like me, right? I can't see the other's interior life, but I deduce it from his behavior in as much as his behavior resembles me. So the other has the dignity of being human only because, because he or she resembles me. You see the problem with this? <laughs> so what if the other doesn't resemble me? Then he's a savage, then he's a primitive, then he's demon possessed. And this is what we had, right? The history of Europe's interaction with other nations has always been, they don't resemble us, therefore they're not completely human. I mean, there are so many examples, real life examples of uh, people going to South America, right? Latin America, and not believing that the Indians had souls because they look so different. And so, um, you know, they would do some experiments to see if they really had a soul. By the way, the, the, the reverse was also true. <laughs> they wondered if we had a soul. <laughs> so, and, and you have, of course, the whole experience with the African continent, with the Indian continent, where because they're different, they're inferior, they don't exist, they don't matter, it's okay to kill them, right? Uh, and so this is the problem, right? As soon as you have a definition of the other as having dignity because resembles me, you've lost any type of real connection with another as other, that is to say, different from me. Okay, am I clear so far? <laughs> Hands in the screen. Any questions so far? I, I said a lot, I feel tired. Any questions so far? <laughs>
Okay. All right, continuing. So, okay, so you can see how the West has an allergy to the other, right? The other doesn't really exist. It's only the one who looks like me. <laughs> then we see them. But if they don't look like me, then really they're not really, we don't see them as having the dignity of humanity because they're so different. And this is really, that was the technique of the Nazis, remember, to show the people that Jews are not quite human. They're not like us. And now all of a sudden, boom, they fall into oblivion because now we don't have any frame of reference to think about the other in their difference. We only know the other who is like me, <laughs> right? That's the issue. So one of the, the real contributions of Levinas to Western thought, honestly, and he has influence, by the way, all of these famous guys, like Derrida, like Baudrillard, like Lyotard, all these famous French guys, he's behind them. He, the main contribution, right, that, that he has made is to, is to really uh, give us a philosophy of the stranger, a philosophy of the other. He's really, that's his goal, is to, is to awaken the Western consciousness to the, the weight of the other. That's really what he's doing, right? Okay. Let's have a few words on his biography, and then I'll talk a little bit about phenomenology and the title of the book. Okay, so he was born in 1906 in Lithuania, uh, from a Jewish kind of modern Orthodox, kind of integrated, right? They were Jewish, but also they were quite assimilated at the same time. Um, the equivalent of modern Orthodox here. Uh, so, so they lived there for a bit, then they moved to the Ukraine because there was a lot of anti-Semitism in, in Lithuania. Same thing happened in the Ukraine. They moved back to Lithuania. It was just the typical uh, wandering Jew story. Uh, so he, so it's, it's tiring. So in 1923, when Levinas is about 17, I think, he moves to France, right? For the simple reason that in France, you have less overt, anti-Semitism, right? Because France is supposed to be secular, therefore there are no distinctions <laughs> between anybody and you have relative peace, right? So he moves to France <clears throat> and he studies philosophy there. He starts his studies. He goes uh, a, a semester, I think two semesters, he goes to study uh, in Germany with Husserl and Heidegger, who are also uh, big mentors of his, right? Um, let me write them down. So Husserl, Heidegger. <clears throat> And then he comes back, uh, finishes his uh, uh, doctorate, uh, and then uh, starts teaching uh, in a Jewish high school, actually. And then the war breaks out in 1939, right? So, and this is the, the turning point. This is, I believe, this is what made Levinas Levinas, this experience in the war, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. So he's, um, he's hired uh, as an officer because he's older. Uh, and shortly after, with his bad luck, he gets captured, right? Within six months. <laughs> uh, he's put in a camp um, not uh, of Jews, right? But they couldn't yet um, deport them because they were wearing the army uniform and under international law, which the Nazis seem to be keeping. <laughs> you cannot uh, kill prisoners of war, right? If they're wearing the army uniform. So he's protected actually by the French uniform, but he's still in a segregated camp for Jewish officers, right? So uh, pretty good level intellectually over there, all officers. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, so he's stuck there for a, a few years, I think, um, because he only, he's only released at the end of the war. Um, and this is where really he begins his um, true, it, it, things begin to shift in his head, right? And there's one story that he tells, which you will see immediately the, the turning point in that story. Um, and this is a story of a dog. <laughs> and it's, he publishes the story in a book, huh, I forget which book, but the essay is called In the Name of a Dog. That's the essay's name, which if you type it in Google, you'll find the book where it's in. <laughs> Uh, anyways, so this is the story. I'll tell you the story. So, um, so every day the prisoners of war were asked to, you know, go out, leave the camp, do some work, railroads, ditches, whatever, right? So they leave every day and they come back. When they leave, of course, they enter uh, different villages, right? Um, with, with like civilians. And uh, they would march through these villages and then do the work and come back. And what they started to notice is the way that the people in the villages 
would, each time they would see them, they would avert their eyes, right? They wouldn't want to look at them. And this was happening over and over again as they walked through the villages, the people would kind of look down, they would look away, they would never really look at them in the eyes or in the face, right? And for a while, they started to really, after a while, right, they started to really get uncomfortable and frustrated because it was starting to feel very dehumanizing, right? This, this refusal to be seen, right? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, he, he writes in the essay how he was starting to feel like he was an animal or something, <laughs> right? So one day they go back to the camp and they, they don't close the door right away. And so there is a stray dog that manages to get in. Now, for the dog lovers among you, you'll understand immediately what happened. The dog, of course, sees people, is overjoyed, <laughs> jumps on them, so happy, wagging the tail and everything. And at that moment, Levinas realizes that this dog is the only being left, right, who still recognizes his humanity, right? The dog immediately recognizes a human being, is happy, he's welcoming, right, unlike the people that they encounter on their, um, when they go to work. So he called actually the dog, the last Kantian in Germany, <laughs> right? So you all know Kant, so you know what he's referring to, right? The philosophy of respect, the philosophy of humanity, what it is to treat someone as a human being, right? And so he's basically saying the Germans have forgotten, all of them, not just the Nazis, ordinary people in the villages are not capable anymore of recognizing my humanity, the only being left capable of doing that is this dog, right? So, so you can see already where he's going to go from there, right? So like I said, right, his whole obsession will be to uh, develop an awareness in the Western psyche for the other, for the, uh, the other as having weight, as having substance, not just a production of the self or not just a mirror of the self, right? And so this is really what will be his endeavor from then on. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, good. Now, here's where phenomenology comes in. So Levinas is trying to come up with an, uh, so this is the, you need to understand this very well. We have a definition of the subject in the West, which is oblivious to the other. That's step one, okay? That's what he's, that's what Horkheimer and Adorno established, right? That's what he is establishing, right? Let me say it again. Definition of the subject and understanding of the subject of the self as oblivious to the other. In other words, I don't need the other to be myself, right? I can become myself, like Kant said, just through the proper use of my reason. The other is kind of like uh, an afterthought. This happens to be there, <laughs> right, around me. It's not really central. The other doesn't have a fundamental, essential role in the life of the Western subject. And this is the problem, right? And so what Levinas is going to attempt to do is to reverse everything. So make sure you listen carefully, right? For the West, the self is the center, produces the other, right? Levinas is going to reverse it. He's going to say, no, the other is the center, and it is the other who produces me. And, and not, not produces, there's a bad expression, but the other awakens me to my own self. That's in essence what Levinas is trying to show in his writing. Let me say it again, right? He, in, he's reversing, right? Just like the West used to say, the self is the beginning, and from the self, everything else is constituted, produced, the outside world, the other, even God. For Descartes, right? Levinas is going to reverse and say, actually, there is no self without the other. It is the other who awakens the self to its consciousness, to its humanity. This is, in essence, his philosophy. Now, how is he going to articulate it? This is the difficult part. So he's looking into the philosophical writings that he knows. And there is one person who seems to be beginning this exploration of the self constituted by the other. And that person is Husserl, right? Uh, and of course, his phenomenology, right? So in other words, even though Husserl is still very much uh, sounding like Kant, sounding like Descartes, his explorations are already hinting 
towards a redefinition of the subject, not as constituting, but as constituted by the other, right? Let me write this down, right? The subject, um, the self, right, is not constituting of the other. He or she is constituted, constituted by the other, right? That we are not producing the other, we are produced awakened by the other. So, so this is why Levinas actually spends so much of his time exploring phenomenology because he senses in that philosophy the, some opening outside of the old Western framework, right? Now Husserl is still very Cartesian, still very uh, Kantian, but he has some progressive moments and that is really where Levinas is, is interesting. He explores these progressive moments, develops them, and this is where you get Levinas's version of phenomenology. Okay, so let's, so we need to take a little time and explore the Husserlian conceptuality because it's going to come out in the writing. Um, <clears throat> I'll do it in detail, of course, in the next time because we're reading something uh, the first chapter, <coughs> which is entirely Husserl, <laughs> pretty much, but I'll do it now already. So listen very carefully. <laughs> I'm going to give you some technical terms that will be useful throughout the essay. This is from Husserl. Okay, so basically, this is Husserl's phenomenology, right? So first of all, what is phenomenology? <laughs> phenomenology is discourse, is the discourse on how things appear. That's literally what phenomenology means. Phenomenon, appearance, logi, logos, discourse. What's, what it actually means is discourse on how we relate to the world, how we connect to existence, right? The self and what appears to the self, outside world, okay? So phenomenology is a study, philosophical study, of how the self relates to the outside world. That's how I would define it in simple terms. Let me say it again. Phenomenology is the study of how the self relates to the outside world, right? Um, and so what's interesting with Husserl, now we have to compare with Kant. With Kant, the self is here and the self basically divides the world into objects at its own, uh, it decides, right? We decide everything in the world whether it exists or not by how we objectify it right so for kant we actually are out there cutting up the world into objects and we are the complete authority here that's why kant says the world as it is might not be at all the world as we perceive it right because we're going around cutting things up according to our own perception are we clear on kant because then you'll understand husserl everybody clear on kant question on kant Right? For Kant, we go around and we cut up the world into objects uh, based on how we perceive the world, which means that Kant is aware that the world as it really is might be completely different from how we perceive it. Right? Okay, Husserl is going to nuance this in a way that Levinas is going to love. He's going to say, well, it's not just that. Because first of all, the object impresses me. Very important. Before I can give meaning and categorize the world into objects, I have to first have a sensation, right? Of light, of wetness, of dryness, of hardness, uh, you know, of distance, of, of proximity, right? A shape. Uh, and that, so I'm hit by either the, through the touch or the hearing or the eyes, I'm hit by an impression. So, and then, my mind puts together what this thing is, right? So there is a partnership here between the world and I in the constitution of objects. First, the world hits me with an impression. Pow! At that moment, I become awake. And then I start to try to understand what has just hit me, right? Suppose you're sleeping and you feel like light on your face. You didn't create that. It struck you. Right? So now you want to know what the hell it is, right? In the middle of the night. So you open your eyes to make sense of it, right? This is how the interaction of the world looks like, according to Husserl. First, the world awakens us, hits us, impresses us, affects us. And then 
we try to make sense of it. So it's not like Kant where you're going around like Adam in the Garden of Eden, bestowing names everywhere by yourself and nobody has any say in the matter. No, you f the world first, there's a wave of the world <laughs> hits you. And then you get, so Levinas loves this. I mean, can anyone tell me why Levinas would love this? This is this part of herself. Let's see if you're following me. <laughs> Here you talk for a bit. I feel like I've taken possession of the discourse today. Why would Levinas love this idea that the world hits me and then I make sense of it? Perez, go ahead. Um, I think it's because he wants to sort of prove or lay the foundation that we find ourselves within another. So if, you know, and before we categorize anything or like think of any or judge anything, it kind of lays an impression on us first. Exactly. What Levinas is perceiving here is the awakening of the self by the other. And Levinas is thrilled. He's like, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm trying to say, right? I'm trying to say that the other constitutes the self. The other is a fundamental moment of the individuation of the self. And he's seeing in Husserl, even though Husserl is not yet talking about people or ethics, he's seeing, like you said very well, Paris, the, the groundwork, the framework. And from then on, Levinas is going to follow that discourse. And of course, he's going to broaden it, right? So just for some terminology, the moment where you're hit by the world, the moment of impression, is called the helitic moment. Okay, the spell check is, it's always like, I can't write. It's not allowing me to write this word. I'm sorry guys. Um, it says philetic moment, but it's helitic moment. H-Y-L-E-T-I, it's correcting me, I can't change it. Let me try again, helitic, like hile, uh, which is uh, in, in uh, Greek, it means matter material, right? So the moment of the, when the oppression hits me, this is called the helitic moment. This is the moment of the ile, which is the moment of the material world hitting me, right? When I begin to make sense of it in response, right? So the moment of making sense, yes, uh, no, not electic, elitic. <laughs> uh, uh, hold on, uh, let me just finish that sentence. Moment of making sense is the noetic from noesis, which means knowledge. Okay, let me try and write this helitic again. Helitic, yes, okay, <laughs> got it. From ile, which means matter. Okay, you guys got, everybody got the two Greek words? Helitic, noetic, helitic, noetic, right? So we're first hit by the matter, by materiality, by light, by sound, by texture, by shape. And then we try to make response, give meaning, right? And this is called the noetic moment. So when we try to give meaning, right? This is also called the moment of signification. This is the title, by the way, of the essay you're gonna read, right? Signification to give meaning. That's what it means. All right, I think I got most of the uh, terminology for now. <laughs> I'm trying to see, yeah. Oh, and one last time, intentionality. This is also something. So intentionality, which is a, a central concept in Husserl, is simply um, the way that we uh, encounter the world uh, is the definition of subjectivity as being always connected to the external world. Let me say that again. So. Remember for Husserl, we are awakened by the other, by the world, and then we give meaning to the world, right? And he says, we are constantly moving towards the world. This is what it means actually for Husserl to be a consciousness. To be conscious is to be constantly connecting to the world. But the also ordinary meaning of consciousness. I'm conscious, I'm seeing, I'm hearing, right? So consciousness is being constantly aware of your surroundings, right? So intentionality, he says, this is the structure of our self, of our subjectivity. We are always intending. We're always intentional. We're always going out towards something, right? To intend means to go 
out towards something. So when Husserl says consciousness is intentional, he's saying we are always in connection. And you should hear Levinas here how happy he is, right? The self is, is when, when Husserl says the self is intentional, what he's saying is the self is always relating to something outside of itself. You should be hearing Buber here. So here, what makes us truly selves is not our rationality, it's our relationality. Everybody caught that? This is important, <laughs> right? What makes our self is not our rationality, but our relationality. We are always moving towards the objects. You should see how Levinas would be happy with this and how it also echoes the philosophy of Buber. Okay, I'm going to drop for now the big terminology before everybody gets exhausted. Any questions on some of these terms? This was just a summary of Husserl's philosophy. <laughs> Now, I would suggest, oh, Kang, go ahead, Kang. <clears throat> um, just to be clear on the timeline, so Husserl was after Buber, yes? Oh, uh, shoot, that's a good question. I, mm, someone, can someone Google this, please? <laughs> when was Husserl? Um, he seems to be around the time of Buber, to be honest, but I just want to get precise dates. Anybody got it? Pario, you're our... <laughs> Googler, are you getting this? <laughs> the dates of Husserl versus the dates of Buber. Let's see who's, who's the best millennial of the class. <laughs> um, Husserl was born like 20 years before Buber. Okay, uh, before. Uh, around right he's a little older than Buber very good yes um Buber to be honest when you read his philosophy you don't sense the influence of Husserl I think Husserl was still you know elaborating himself um uh, Buber is more influenced by Kant right he's more connected to Kant I don't see any Husserl or Heidegger in Buber uh and it could be possibly because they were almost contemporary so they don't know each other that well I see uh, something in the chat. <laughs> oh, you're Generation Z. Am I, am I behind <laughs> in locating who you guys are? Okay, <laughs> good. All right. Um, any other questions on, on the Husserlian terminology? I mean, um, try to read up on him if you want. You don't have to know him that well. But if you go to the encyclopedia, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia, I think it's, play, uh, I'll just write it down. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. This is a good resource to have. Um, you will get a really good, it's an online encyclopedia of philosophy. You can get a good summary of Husserl, phenomenology, and this will actually really help you understand Levinas in depth. But don't worry, I will explain it in any ways, right? Just in case you want to go further. Okay, let's talk briefly about the title of the book, which is Humanism of the Other. So if you're, uh, if you're a little conscious of who was writing at the time of Levinas when he came up with this book, you would know that two people had already written an important work on humanism, which Levinas is actually going to uh, add to, right? You had, well, let me ask you, anybody know what were the two people in France, in Germany, who wrote something with the word humanism in it? <laughs> Let's see how, how is your... <laughs> Um, general knowledge of European philosophy. Thank you, Han Murad. Excellent. That's the first one, Sartre. There's a second one who responded to Sartre, actually. Sartre, I can't say it like that. Sartre, are we okay with my French pronunciation? Sartre, are we good? Everybody good? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Sartre was, uh, he wrote this and then someone responded to him. Anybody know who it was who responded to him and disagreed with him? Um, Camus would be the type to disagree with, with uh, Sartre, but not, uh, not, not, not that one. <laughs> uh, German, German guy that we talked about already. <laughs> we do need to have a class on this. Heidegger, very good, Hammerad. Heidegger, who wrote uh, another, in response, he wrote a letter on humanism. It's very beautiful work also, right? Heidegger has very nice uh, work in general. 
So let's go over that, right? Because Levin is going to respond to both of them. So let's talk a little bit about Sartre and existentialism as a humanism. So that book, actually not great philosophically speaking, not very rigorous, but really great read uh, in terms of getting a sense of <clears throat> where Sartre is going and so forth. So in that text, you have the famous quote, uh, existence precedes essence, right? And basically the argument is this, that Sartre is making. He's saying we are nothing more than our actions. Right, this is very important, by the way, for the post-war atmosphere. Sartre is also responding to, to the war, like Levinas, and he's saying, people who say they're good people but didn't move a finger to help are not good people. That's basically what he's saying, right? You are nothing but the sum of your actions. And if you think you're good, but you don't act good, you're not good, right? So he's responding to many people in France who said, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person, but I just couldn't do anything, but I'm a good person. And he would be like, no, you're not, <laughs> right? Because then you would have done something, right? This is in essence what means existence precedes essence. Your life, the way you lived your life, precedes who you are. That's who you are. Kogan. <clears throat> Go ahead, Kogan. Um, so, the much of what much of what um, it seems that Levinas is saying, you know, seems to be very similar to um, uh, to Buber's uh, you know, perspective. Um, you know, obvi obviously, it's be it could be due to the fact that they come from very similar backgrounds, um, but. You know what? What would you say would be the the difference between what what Buber said and what Levinas is saying? Because they are very similar from what you know the emphasis on action, you know, as opposed to what you see or as opposed to just the words that you say or what you hear, you know, um, and the emphasis on you know uh, you know Buber calls it the you and Levinas calls it the other, but they're, unless I'm mistaken, they're also very similar concepts. The you versus the other, it seems to be very similar as well. So what, what's, the, what's the real difference between them? So uh, there is no fundamental difference. They are saying in essence the same thing, except that Levinas is going much deeper in terms of what it means uh, in terms of that, remember how Buber said um, the, uh, the you challenges me or confronts me? Levinas is going to develop this to death, <laughs> right? What does it really mean? And he's going to articulate a philosophy of sacrifice, which is going to be very disturbing for many of his readers, right? So Buber kind of, uh, he, he's on, he stays on the, he scratches the, sur Buber is kind of on the surface. He has, he has a few ideas kind of like intuitions and Levinas kind of really develops these intuitions philosophically. But fundamentally, you're right, Kogan, it's a similar idea of the other making you the, remember the you makes me an I, very similar ideas that the you confronts me. Levinas is just going to develop a lot of what Buber is saying, just like Buber developed Kant, right? Does that make sense, Kogan? Mm -hmm. okay. Sosa, you have your hand, go ahead. Okay, so Levinas pretty much is going to say that your actions is what's going to make you a good person. So by not taking the actions, it's, you know, not, it shows that you're not a good person, just to confirm, correct? That's not Levinas, that's Sartre. Sartre. Oh, Sartre, okay. So <laughs> regarding that in mind, so if you are simply unable to do anything out of fear, does that simply just not make you a good person just because yeah. you're afraid? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's really foul, but okay. What you are at that moment is a coward. <laughs> okay, I see. Because you're acting based on fear, right? That's a coward. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's idea. So that's Sartre, right? And so basically, now to go a little further, what, what Sartre is saying is that we can choose who we are based on how we act. This is where it becomes interesting and very, very Western, actually. Right? Sartre says, actually, I can choose my identity. If I choose to be a fool and act like a fool, I can become that. I can become this. I could be this. I could be that. Very Nietzsche, right? Very much like Nietzsche. Right? So, so in essence, what Sartre is saying is the self can become itself by itself through its own actions. You can sense how Levinas is already feeling uncomfortable and Buber too, right? So let make sure you write this down, that the ultimate consequence of what Sartre is saying is that I am in control of my identity, 
that's what he's saying. I am in control of who I am as a self. Me alone determine who I am by my actions. And you can see there how Sartre is very, very much a European, <laughs> right? Very Western. Me, I'm in control, individually deciding who I will be. Uh, and of course, uh, the problem, of course, with that, Levinas would say, is again, the other, there is no room for the other. And in Sartre, you know, if you read some of his novels, how the other uh, has a very, very problematic place. <laughs> in fact, you know the famous quote by Sartre in one of his novels where he says, hell is the other person. <laughs> some of you might be living that at home right now. A lot of you in, in the quarantine are, are, should be reading uh, this work by Sartre called No Exit. Ah, this is a great, <laughs> that's a, a text by Sartre where he's basically saying hell is other people. <laughs> it's very problematic, right? So Heidegger responds, right? He's like, I don't agree with you, he says, right? We are not making our own destinies. Actually, says Heidegger, what makes us truly human is our connection to being. Okay, I'm really going over everything in such a superficial way, right? So Heidegger, the self is constituted by being. It is in as much as we are connected to being, aware of our being, aware of the mystery that inhabits us, I guess I'll say it like that, right? That we are truly human. And for Heidegger, most of us are losing this connection with our inner mystery because we're always distracted, right? This is Heidegger in a nutshell, right? We're losing this connection with the depth of our lives, with the mystery that inhabits us, which he calls being. We have lost our connection and we are constantly trying to forget everything by being distracted by our iPhones, our televisions, this, that, and we've and we lose this connection, right? So he's saying what? And this is where Levinas is interested. Why? Tell me why Levinas would be excited about what Heidegger is saying, even though Heidegger is not yet where Levinas is. When Heidegger is saying it's our connection to being which makes us who we are, which makes us a true self. Why would Levinas be excited at that moment? <clears throat> when reading Heidegger. Okay, I see two hands. So Perez, go ahead. Uh, because in being, you're forced to be in the, I guess, form of being with others automatically. Like how can you be, how can you process being without another? In general. Uh, so right. Heidegger, you can actually, this is one of the problems of Heidegger. The, the connection to being is made through art, through literature. <laughs> you see, he's a very good German in that sense, a very German way of thinking. Um, so that's what Levinas will reproach Heidegger. So Heidegger, actually, you don't need the other. You just need this connection with being, which can be done through philosophy, through art, through religion. Uh, do, do you follow me, Perez? Sort of. So, but doesn't that also... This, but that's connection. You're connecting with somebody yes, else's work. And that's it. That's what Levinas likes. Heidegger is talking about the self as connected, relational again. Yes, it's being, it's a bit abstract, but he likes that. He likes the way that the self depends on something outside of itself to be truly human. If I am disconnected from being, which is something bigger than me, then I'm not truly myself. You see how he's butting heads with Sartre, right? Sartre is like, I, I got this. <laughs> I can do this. I'm figuring myself out. And, and uh, what's his face? Heidegger would say, no, you, you can't figure yourself out. You will figure who you are by reconnecting to something outside of yourself, which is being and living us is like, yes, I love it, right? Because he's always looking for becoming through a connection to something outside. Uh, does that make sense, Perez? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, okay, a couple more. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, King, you're complaining. Go ahead, King. <laughs> your complaint is uh, legitimate. Go ahead, tell us a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're trying to say that you could um, grow by um, experiencing these different types of, I, I don't know what to call it, but, it, you know, other things. Let's just generalize it as art, right? 
you, you can grow by experiencing these art, but if, if you're making the art, then that's just self-reflection. And if the art's come from somebody else, which it, most of it is, then that's, that's an interaction with the other. Yeah. So you are relying on the other at the end of the day. So I totally agree. You can't, yeah. you can't just say that, you know, it's, it's all internal. Absolutely. And this is, this is Heidegger's blind spot, right? He doesn't see how most of these works, right? Art, literature is really not some, is, is something that the other is bringing to you, right? But he's, I think he's seeing it more like when I am doing art, <laughs> when I am doing literature, I am connecting to being. I think he's seeing it in more an individual way, right? Uh, and he is, I mean, he's a beautiful writer, I have to say, right? Especially if you read uh, in the original, I mean, you know, it's, it's the way he, he, he um, manipulates the German language is very poetic, right? He's doing it, he's himself an artist, right? But he's saying, as I am writing, as I am speaking, I am connecting to being, right? So all of us should have our personal art form through which we connect to being, whether it's music or dance, but it's not the other giving it to you for Heidegger, it's you doing it and thereby connecting to being. Do you follow, King? <clears throat> uh, kind of. Um, <laughs> but you I don't have to agree. I, I feel like I'm going to nitpick and say, well, is the only art <laughs> he's making self-portraits? or like <laughs> no because being is in is inspiring this great work of art right so it's not a self-portrait it's something deep within you bigger than you which is inspiring this work of art so you are still a, something is rushing through you right and so it's going to be bigger than a self-portrait does that make sense king <laughs> sure <laughs> Okay, uh, point taken though, I agree with you. Coco, you want to add and then come? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, this has been, I was thinking about this for like the last 10 or so minutes, uh, so my apologies. So maybe I, maybe you answered it and I was stuck in my own head, but um, <laughs> is, do Sartre, uh, thought and Levinas uh, truly contradict each other that harshly? Because quite frankly, I noticed something very interesting is that one says, one has a, no, soft, at least in my understanding, has the notion of you are uh, the person you are by your own actions, by your own choices, et cetera, et cetera. To me, that doesn't contradict Levinas in the sense of, don't get me wrong, your own actions and your own choices can also be in contact with the other. For, like, who I am as a person, ref like the uh, notion of I am who I, what, who I choose to be. My choices affect other people, and but I am the, at the end of the day in making my own choice. Mm -hmm. That's not to say, so I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but to me, it just, I don't see the contradiction. I don't see why Levinas would immediately like say, no, sure, if you go too far with it and you say, oh, no, only I exist, only I exist, sure, obviously. But no, I would argue that inherently that on a base fundamental level that they don't contradict. Or am I... uh, yeah, if you go a little deeper with Sartre, when, when you think, well, what causes my actions? Uh, is it the other person asking me to act in such a way and so forth, right? And so then you have a kind of relational. The thing with Sartre, though, is that no matter what the other does, ultimately, I decide alone. <laughs> so there is no influence of the other in my decision, according to... I, I mean, that is a problem. I agree with that. I mean... Yeah. Not to say that there's no influence, but there is, there is something to the statement of my choice is still mine. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe yeah. I, 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 I have a hard time just removing myself from that notion because I'm like, no, that's the concept of free fuck. Sorry. That's the concept of free will. Yes, and now you're entering Livinas, who is actually a complete critique of this notion of free will. Yes, yes. I'm going to talk about that. Levinas okay. actually, we'll see in the text, is going to have to redefine free will and freedom. The word freedom is going to mean something else in Levinas. There is no freedom for Levinas. We're going to talk about that. He, remember, Levinas is going, he's, he's doing some very difficult, uh, he's, he's doing kind of like Nietzsche, powerful, um, how shall I put it? Um, it's like punches, okay? <laughs> it's like he's, it, hey. he's giving the best punches against Western philosophy. It's a bit too much sometimes, maybe, maybe not. But he wants to flip it. So he's going to, of course, say, well, you, want, you say that you want complete freedom, but I'm going to show you that there is never any complete freedom. <laughs> uh, and that if you truly want to become a human being, you have to learn 
this art of passivity, this art of receptivity, this art of being influenced, right? We're going to talk about that. So by the way, Levinas is going to feel very alienating to some of us. <laughs> we'll see. I don't okay. know. Just to me, it's like, no matter how much you, someone tries to persuade me to do something, they can persuade me and I listen, of course, you know, but I'm, that's my, me making the choice to listen to them. Yes. I'm making my own choice to listen. There's a choice. At the end and of the day, there is still, yes. there's still a free choice. Living that's as not, for the choice, but before the choice, there is the awakening of which you have no control, <laughs> which we'll talk about. Kang, would you like to add something or is your hand up from last time? So, um, I don't want, my head is kind of spinning. I don't want to get too complicated, um, but didn't, didn't Heidegger say that there were like two kinds of being, the being and being yeah. with? Uh, yes. So you have being with a big B, which is this mystery within us that we connect to through art, right? And then you have beings, which is everybody, all the objects of the world, right? When he says we get lost in the world of beings, all of the objects, instead of connecting to being, capital B, which is the source of our being, right? So he talks about ontological versus ontic, right? Um, so for him, we need to abandon the world of beings to connect to being. Am I making sense, Khan? I like Buber with the I, it versus I, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, except there's no you in Heidegger. Being is abstract. This is the problem with Heidegger, right? This is what Levinas will never forgive Heidegger <laughs> for omitting any type of encounter with the other. The other is just part of the world of beings. <laughs> He's like out there, right? The real relationship for Heidegger is an inner relationship to this mystery. Uh, and in a sense, this is almost a mystical but it's not an ethical stance. This is where Levinas gets uncomfortable. Uh, are we good, Kang? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so let's quickly go now to Levinas, the way he's gonna develop his own humanism, right? This is all humanism, right? What it means to be human. Sartre says to be human is to be free to choose my own destiny. Heidegger says to be human is to connect to being. Levinas is going to agree actually with Heidegger to a certain degree. He's gonna say, yes, to be human is connectivity, but not to some abstract entity like being, connectivity to another human being. That's what makes us human. Humanism as ethics, not as ontology like Heidegger, not as you know, existentialism like Sartre, ethics is the key to recovering our humanity. So he's gonna talk just like Heidegger and say what makes us human is connectivity, but not to some abstract mystery, connectivity to the mystery of the other, right? Let me say that, let me write it in the chat, right? So for Levinas, um, what makes us human, right? Humanism, right? Human is our ability to connect, like for Heidegger, right? To a human, to the mystery in another human being, okay? And that's really where he's leaving behind Sartre, who says to be human is to be me. <laughs> leaving behind Heidegger, who says being is the only thing that matters, and say, no, ultimately to be human is to be relating to another human being. Ethics is the royal road of humanism, not existentialism, not ontology, ethics. Okay, are we all good? <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Uh, this is difficult. I, Levinas is very, very difficult, but we'll get through it. <laughs> You'll get the gist of it at least. Um, so, like I said, very difficult read. Don't worry. To really understand Levinas, you need to know philosophy by heart from Plato to Heidegger <laughs> because he's constantly alluding to them. And a lot of the language he's using is the language of phenomenology. If, if you don't know phenomenology, you're going to be lost, especially since he's using it in his own way, not even in the way that Husserl <laughs> talks about. But don't worry, just do the reading assignment best you can, and I will clarify what needs to be clarified uh, in class. Okay, um, good. Um, uh, there was somebody I needed. Uh, so Osorio, you have, did you leave already? <laughs> Let me see. Let me stop the recording.